This episode of My Best Eleven Pod is sponsored by JB Developments Luton Limited. Oh, so welcome to a, another episode of My Best Eleven. Um, my name is Andrew McMillan, um, and I'm joined by, as ever, our co-host across in America, Marv. How are you? Good morning, Marvin Johnson. Good morning, Andrew. I am wide awake this morning because, thankfully, our guest has given us an extra an hour in bed and got home for a later time. So I'm bright, starry-eyed, and I'm ready to go. Excellent. So our guest this week, we are so, so excited to have on an absolute legend of so many clubs. We don't say this very often, but this man has played um, at a number of clubs, started his career at Luton, then went across to um, Arsenal at the time was our Luton's biggest transfer fee um, received, and then went across to West Ham, Wimbledon, then decided to um, move, move up, slowly move up north to Coventry and then made his way up to Celtic, which is where he spent the majority of his time, um, and then came back down for a little bit um, towards the end of his career. If you haven't guessed it already, I will let his accent see if he can help you um, guess who it is. Hello, our guest today. Welcome. Thank you very much. Nice to be on here. Thank you. As your young guest, it is John Hartson, the absolute great, great Welsh player um, as well. Played over um, 50 caps for Wales. Um, which is fantastic. So congratulations, John. Um, we're going to launch straight in as we always do um, with the first question <clears throat> I like to ask people is, do you know the name of all of the nicknames of all the clubs you've ever played for, John? I can have a go. Okay, when you're ready, in any order. In any order, go on. Well, I'll start from the beginning because I think I might find it easier if I run through my clubs as, yeah. as they came, you know. So I'll start with Luton, the Hatters. Then I went to Arsenal, the Gunners. Then I went to West Ham, which is the Irons. From West Ham, I went to Wimbledon, who are the Dons or the Crazy Gang, if you like. From Wimbledon, I had a short spell at Coventry, the Sky Blues. From Coventry, I went to Celtic, who are the Hoops. From Celtic, I went to West Brom. Brian Robson signed me and Kevin Phillips on the same day. They are the Baggies. And I had a short stint with Glenn Roder for a month at Norwich, who are the Canaries. <laughs> so I played for eight clubs, and they are the order of the clubs, and they are the nicknames of all the clubs. So I'm not even written that down, boys. That came straight from them. <laughs> it's quite sharp today. In, as you say, in Wales, Marv, I can think of a few nicknames that I was called <laughs> while being a Welsh player. I won't <laughs> mention that on air, though. He's, he's, he's known that, hasn't he? He's nailed it, hasn't he, Andrew? 100%. 100%. 100%. You know what? I, I got thrown because I thought um, West Ham was the Hammers, so the Irons. Oh, do you know what? The, the Hammers, the Irons, it's like Celtic. Celtic, you can call right. them the Celts, you can call okay. them the Hoops. So right. do you know what? You probably are right, Marv. They probably are known as the Hammers, but also... The Irons, because a lot yeah, of West Ham fans, yeah, they yeah. do that. The Irons, yeah, you know, yeah, so. that's why. I, yeah, but I thought, I, you know, I thought, I oh didn't my realize gosh. you were going to be so pernickety, Mark. No, 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 no. Listen, trust me. As we, as you'll see on this season, I'm listen. I'm nowhere near. Nowhere near. The, the worry is, I asked Marv the same question, and he's a one club man, and he didn't get that right. That was my worry. It took me ages. It took me ages to get it. <laughs> and he's only ever played for Luton. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll start off with thank you very much for that so we'll start off with you obviously being a striker spent most of your time up front um, have you gone for an attacking formation we always love to hear the formations to start off with what have you gone for John <clears throat> well I've gone with a I've gone with a 4-3-3 three, three. because as you're about to see I, I was very fortunate during my career I, I played with some wonderful players 
Um, I really did. Um, I mean, some real world-class players who I'm very humbled and very honoured to have shared the pitch with. You know, um, so, you know, I've gone for a 4-3-3 formation. I've, I've, I've stuck a couple of players that I could have played with a centre-forward. I've actually put them into midfield. Wow. Uh, one or two I've added because... It's a case of I wanted to get my best players in the yeah. one team. I remember Mark Hughes with Wales. Wales had a fantastic front three, Marv. You'd have played against them all. Ian Rush, Mark Hughes, Dean Saunders. Yeah. I remember when Terry Orloff was the manager of Wales national team. He couldn't leave Mark Hughes out. Sparky was an unbelievable player. The best player I ever saw with his back to goal. Oh, you know, strong. Was a scorer of great goals as well. So what um, Terry Orroth decided to do, he had Dean Saunders playing for Liverpool, he had Ian Rush at Juventus, and he had Mark Hughes playing for Manchester United. Three top players playing at the highest level in world football. He couldn't read Rush, Hughes or Saunders out of the team. So up top, he played Rush and Saunders, and he put Mark Hughes in the middle of the park to play in midfield as somebody who had a natural instinct of getting forward and getting into forward positions and playing off the front two, if you like. And he was also a bit of a dog in the middle of the park, yeah. you know, he win tackles for you. So I've done similar. I've done similar with Brilliant. my, with my yeah. best 11. Fantastic. Awesome. So off, we'll, we'll, start, we'll start you off then. Goalkeeper. Go. What, who have we gone for my in goal? Goalkeeper. I played with I played with some really good goalkeepers. The top three I played with was was obviously Neville Southall, who who in the in the early nineties Neville Southall would have been the best goalkeeper in the world. Um, he was unbelievable, big nerve for Everton. I think he had ninety three caps uh, for Wales. For for a record, it's for a number of time he was the most capped uh, player uh, for for for, uh, for for his country. So Neville Southall was up there. I also, at, at Arsenal, David Seaman was fantastic, a magnificent goalkeeper. And at West Ham, I played with a guy called Ludo McCloskey, who, who was outstanding to stop everything, big Ludo. But the one I've gone for is, um, is David Seaman. Um, I just think that when I was at Arsenal, I played with the likes of Wrighty and Merson and, and, and Bergkamp and these players. And I remember vaguely, Bob, Bob Wilson used to be his coach. Yeah. And Bob was a great keeper for Arsenal. He won the double at Arsenal, Bob Wilson. And um, I remember on one Friday morning, we were doing a, a, a session, like just a shooting session before for half an hour before we went in. And I remember with the class of the righties and the bird camps and the Mersons, for about half an hour, we couldn't beat him. We could Ow. not beat David Seaman. He saved everything. And I mean, wow. he was plucking things out of the top corner, tipping things low down around the post. And Marv, you know, right here, and a few of the guys, um, they were some of the best finishers on the planet. You know, Ian Wright was an incredible finisher, great player. So the one I'm going to go for, my goalkeeper, is, uh, is David Seaman. David Seaman. You, you, you gotta, you gotta make, give it, give us a little bit of, make it a bit of fun for us. You, you could have given us the three names and then I let, let uh, Andrew and I say, guess who it might have been. So you've, oh, you've right, saved okay. it. Well, no, no, with the right back. You, no, no, you no, saved it. Excellent. Oh, yeah, yeah. You've, you've no, saved right. Andrew there. Carl, I would have been all over him, Arts. You've saved Andrew there because I would have been all over Seaman. I would have got that in the Indeed. heartbeat. Yeah, I love Seaman. Like, oh, right, was, right. Seaman was incredible. Um, as a goalkeeper, do you think that Seaman got better with age? Do you think goalkeepers do get better with age? Um, or do you think course, when you were yeah. at Arsenal that was his peak? I think, I think goalkeepers play a bit longer, don't they? I think they can yeah. play goalkeepers up until the late 30s. I know footballers are now as well, the outfield players, because players are looking after themselves now a lot better than, say, for instance, when 20 years ago or even. 25 years ago when Marv was playing, you know, it wasn't so much, you know, I think the the sports science is all there now and, you know, the education in terms of, you know, what what, what is good for you, you know, what not to eat, what to eat. And, and, I'm and just I think, laugh, I'm laughing at a, uh, um, 
um, when back at when the Luton and, and I don't know if you can remember, you, you had a reserve <laughs> reserve team game, and you and four. I don't know if you and Wayne was taking a reserve team. Oh, you went across the back of the road, and you come in, and Wayne's gone. What you what you been, John? I was hungry when I went and got some food. Where? A uh, chip shop. <laughs> Wayne lost. Do you remember? A chip shop. An effing chip shop. And like, and like you just said, then it just. <laughs> it's oh, brilliant. Really Johnny, you know what's so remarkable about that? Go on. I think we won the game three 0 and I scored two. <laughs> <laughs> So I think I got away with it, Bob, you know. But no, I, I, think, I, think, I think goalkeepers in general, you know, they, they do tend to play longer. Um, yeah. And nowadays, I remember Arsene Wenger came to the football club and he changed all the diet. He changed all the mm. stretching and running for 10 minutes in the morning before we even kicked the ball just to get the lactic acid out of your body. And he brought so many different methods and different theories and Arsene Wenger was a genius for what he achieved at Arsenal. And even, even today, I think you like you talk to what you listen to the likes of Tony Adams and Boldy and Nige and Wrighty and Mersh. Them guys played an extra two or three years. Yeah. yeah. Arsene Wenger put two or three years on top right. of their careers um, just because of they took on board what the managers were saying. Yeah. And before that, you know that we know we know there was there was a drinking culture at Arsenal and you know out for lunch most days and everything yeah. else. That all stopped, but not necessarily because the manager said, "Let's stop doing that and let's do it this way." Because the players tuned in, they wanted yeah. to, you know, make them changes, and and they benefit for that. They benefited for that. So, uh, but no, David Seaman, again, like Excellent. a lot of other goalkeepers, we saw him in the World Cup. Make uh, whether it was an error or not. Remember Ronaldinho's free kick in one of the World Cups from Brazil, where he, he's, he's hit it right yeah. in the top corner. Yeah. And then in the Cup Winners' Cup final against um, Zaragoza, Naim, a former Spurs player, chipped in from the halfway line in Paris, a game that I played in the Cup Winners' Cup and yet final. Scored and scored yeah. and scored. And he cried he out. Was almost, you know, got caught out. Um, yeah. So he might even say himself, uh, David, if he was if he was listed, he might say himself they were probably errors. But I don't know a goalkeeper who, who's never made an error. Exactly. You know, and the problem yeah. is a defender can make a mistake. The goalkeeper's behind him, or a midfielder can give the ball away, or a striker. There's How many strikers have missed an open goal in their career and don't get anywhere near as berated as David Seaman has? Or... Exactly, because it's a goalkeeper, yeah. there's nobody behind you, just the goals. So, uh, yeah. But, but if you, you add up the amount of games and the few little mistakes he made, then you know what the, the, the general press may be and people, they always tend to bring up the mistakes and the things like that. Yeah. Uh, what was, mind, um, what was Seaman? One of the sheets that he kept doing his career, you know? Yeah. What, what was Seaman like after that Cup Winners' Cup game? I mean, obviously you saw him just that shaking head of dismay um, and he saw yeah. this, almost a similar face in the Ronaldinho one. What was he like yeah. in the dressing room after? Was he, did he take it upon himself or what was it like? Yeah, it, it was one of them where I think he would have known deep down he should and could have saved it. Um, but it's not Marv's played in dressing rooms and it's, it's not one of them where the players go in and they, they vent their disappointment, you know, directly to the goalkeeper. You know, th there's a... Um, there's a line that, you know, yeah. you don't cross. You know, every, everybody knows that David Seymour was a great keeper. He would, he would have been feeling bad enough as it is. He would have been feeling like he's let his teammates down, let himself down, let the fans down. I've made mistakes. And, you know, and the thing was, he was very quiet. You know, the lads were going over to him and saying, look, don't worry about it. You've saved us in so many games. Some of the saves you've actually pulled off in this competition, you've actually kept us in the competition. Now that we're in the final... So, you know, you couldn't say much to him, but I think as a top-class professional and, and an individual, he would have known himself. He didn't need to be told. He was very, very down. He was very, very... Because we were one minute from going into penalties and we'd won against Sampdoria over two legs in Genoa. Uh, we beat Sampdoria on penalties in the semi-final and it was Sven Goran Eriksson was their manager, Lombardo... Mancini, they were playing for Sampdoria at the time and I scored my penalty. So we beat Genoa and David Seaman made about two or three saves in that penalty shootout. 
So that was a shame because if it'd gone to penalties in the final, it went to the it went to the hundred and nineteenth minute and it was the last kick of the game. I fancy David Seaman would have stood up and saved more penalties. So we it's like you know, Marv, it's like in football, it's it's fine margins. Yeah. You know, one minute you're a hero, next minute you're a villain. We were that close from taking it into penalties. Yeah. And we had the best goalkeeper in the world in goal for us. So, yeah. you know, that's how precarious things can be sometimes. Mm. Okay, um, moving on to the right back. We're going to try and have a little bit of a guess. You can maybe give us some clues. Maybe if he was an international, which I'm sure quite yeah. a few of your players might have been. So let's go. Game on. Well, again, I played with a, quite a few. Um, you know, the, the, I played with a guy at Celtic. It's, it's not in my team, but I'll tell you, it was Didier mm. Agat. Uh, Didier was a fantastic right back, up and down the wing. And for about two years, I think he was one of the best right backs in Europe. There was a lot of the big European clubs um, talking about him because his performances were on a different level. He was so quick. Um, and you know yourself, Marv, if you're going to play wing back, you need great energy levels. You need to be good on the ball because generally the ball, the possession you have, you go wide. And then wing backs are so important as to, you know, delivery, getting back, defending. You know, they need to be so fit and fitness. Yeah. They probably do more running than anybody else on the pitch, their wing backs. And DJ was a fantastic player. Um, uh, so I played with DJ Gat, but the one, I've, the one I've, um, I've named is uh, he's an ex international, English, um, again, uh, lived in the same part of the world, not far from where we live, Marv. Um, what club was he at with you? Yeah. Oh, oh, is it? He can't ask that question. It's well, clearly okay, hard. Okay, go on, go on, go on. Oh, Lee Dixon. Right. He was at Arsenal. He probably made over 600 appearances. An Lee absolute Dixon. legend. Yeah. Yes. He lived, got... he lived in a place not too far from us. When we Lee were Dixon? Was it Lee, Lee Dixon? Dixon? Oh, yeah, it's Lee Dixon. Oh, Andrew yeah. got he, before he, me. What an Andrew. He lived in Harpington as well. Yeah. Right. And um, No, Lee was a fantastic right back. Very reliable. Um Part of that famous Arsenal back four, you know, hardly conceded a goal. Uh, so I had to give it to Lee. Another one I played with, I got him written down here, was Tim Breaker. Uh, oh, Tim was good at that Luton. And I played with Breaks at West Ham as well. That's right. Yeah, yeah so Tim was great. Again, energy levels, he great yeah. shape, looked after himself, Marv, didn't he? Yes, and, he did. Uh, he, he would get forward, he would get back, and he would always look for me on the back post, Tim. At West Ham, certainly I was more younger, didn't play much with him. I think he moved on by the time I, I played, got into the Luton team. Um, but Tim was another great right back. Uh, so I've gone for Lee Dixon again. He's right. the link up as well with Arsenal, Seaman, and Dixon. Excellent. I, I'm wondering if I'm just going to start guessing Arsenal defence. I'm wondering if the whole back four is just going to be. Don't give anything away. I'm wondering if the whole back four is just going to be the Arsenal defence. I think that'd be too easy. I, I think he's smarter than that. I don't know. I think it'd be that way too easy. Okay, let's go to, let's go go to the left back. Go my on. left back. Um, I've Mar gone. Look at Marv's Mar Mar face. Look at Marv's face. He's <laughs> grinning. He's got his fingers crossed. He's got his toes crossed. John. <laughs> yeah. No, well, I've gone for I've gone for a, a guy that was. Um, I was quite physical. You know, I, I was very, very aggressive. I, I don't mean dirty or no throwing your elbows. I never went over the ball to do people and things like that. But I loved, I loved showing people my strength. I loved backing in and holding defenders off and almost saying to the crowd, he can't get the ball off me. I'm embarrassing this. You know, he can't. He can't get near me. I was too big. I was too strong. And I would then roll people if they got too close to me, you know. Um, and this player was equally as aggressive. He was a left back. I got him. I got him. I got him. I got him. His nickname, his nickname is the Terminator. That's what he's known as. A legend at West Ham. Had a test. Julian ball. Dix. Julian Dix. Julian, you got it. Uh, Julian Dix is my left back because um, he was a fantastic player and uh, he used to get up and down the left hand side. He could play centre half as well. Mm. Deliveries from corners, set pieces. He, he could stick it on your chest from 40, 50 yards. Harry Redknapp loved him. The West Ham fans absolutely idolised him. So 
My left back would be Julian Dixon. Besides that, he's now working with Slavon Bilic at West Ham as his number oh, two. Excellent. Slavon was in, a, I, I had 18 months with Slavon at West Ham as well before he went and played, moved uh, to Everton. Um, so Julian Dix, so it's Seaman, Dixie, and uh, Toddy, it's a Dicko, a Dixie, Lee Dixie. Lee Dixie. <laughs> so, so, so Johnny, I just want to go back to when you was just talking about like being the centre forward and holding them off. And um, again, because we, we played together at Luton, this story is going to be a again, about a Luton player. I'm not sure if you'd remember like, the rugby club, where we turned up the rugby club, and I think you might yeah. have been about... Stockwood, Stock, Stockwood Park there. So again? Stockwood Park. Just, yeah, just, oh, yeah, just opposite the rugby yeah. club, there, where that little place yeah. where we oh, used okay. to Yeah, and so, um, I think you might have been about 16, 17 at the time in the, in the reserves, and I don't know if Trevor Peak was playing in the first team, and... Peaking we were in. running and we were playing against <laughs> we were playing against Andrew, we were playing against the reserves and, and this is I don't know why I was watching it, maybe I was injured again, or I don't know, yeah. whatever. And I just saw I saw what I witnessed was like, whoa. Cause like Johnny, like he just said, it was strong. And so Peaky was a good, hard, tough yeah. defender, wouldn't back down. And and I remember Johnny got the ball, turned Peaky, and now started running from the halfway line with the ball as a 16, year old and Peaky was like a, a, a renowned, obviously pro, never said that, came back at Johnny and then he'd come on Johnny's back and was like, bang, get off. Like, this is from Johnny, sort of thing. Peaky's gone down, but got up again, ran after Johnny and he's gone to like, to, to like tussle with him sort of thing. And Johnny's like, bang, get off, stroked him off again. Three times it's happened all the way down the field. And I think, I mean, you had a shot. And I'm looking, I'm thinking, whoa. This mm. kid, like, I mean, and it's, and it's Trevor Peaks playing the cup final against Tottenham, World Cup winner, and I'm thinking, if he's doing this now to, like, someone of Peaky's mm. experience, and this this kid is going to be, like, whew, one to watch. And I thought, good job that weren't me on the field. <laughs> I mean, I don't know why I was watching, obviously. I, was, I mean, I don't know what. Yeah. I don't know if you remember that time when we used to play. Oh, I, do. Well, against uh, the I, I do, Marv, and I used to love that because David Pleat, as you know, um, on a Friday morning, uh, what would generally happen was he would um, he would have a, like a 11 v 11 and, you, and the first team would play the, the youth team and it's more a case of just going through set pieces for the That's game right. tomorrow you know David Pink would line up his, his back four where the strikers where the midfield he said right take a court take a free kick from wide left take a free kick on the edge of the area let's, let's get a, a wall and I used to love that because I used to think this is my chance yeah. This is my chance at 16, 17 to show yeah. David Pleat I shouldn't be in the youth team tomorrow. I was that focused and aggressive yeah. and hungry. I want to be in the first team. So my chance was to get over and have a practice, play against the first team, smash as many people as I could, make an impact straight away. So David Pleat's going, oh my God, who, who is this yeah. kid? And that's yeah. what I say to kids now. Yeah, I see right. the children now. When you get a chance, listen, I say smash. I just mean be aggressive. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. Do you know what I mean? I don't mean yeah, go of you, you can't no, do we that. Yeah, of course. You wouldn't last, Matt. Do you know, you'd be set exactly. up and down. Yeah. But my point was, and I remember it, it was Tumble, it was John Dreyer. My dad came up to watch a youth team game once at Electrolux, Cherry West. That's right. yeah. I think I, we played Tottenham, I think, and Sol Campbell was in Spurs' youth team. We're the same age, me and Saul. We played right the way through together against each other. And um, and what happened was, I think we won 3 0 or we won 3 2, and I got two late goals. So we come into the ground, we finish the game, we're happy. Our game used to finish about half past 12 on a Saturday. So then we come down to Kenilworth Road to watch the first team play. Yeah. And we bumped into John Dreyer in the car park. And I'm only 17. John Dre was a, a centre half for Luton, yeah. an experienced centre half, left sided yeah. player. And um, um, my dad said to John, oh, I did well today, John. He, you know, they won 3 2. John was always welcome into my, my dad when he came up. And, and John said, Mr. Hartson, he said, let me tell you something. He said, John should be on our first team today, not playing <laughs> for the youth team. That's what John said to my dad. And I'm yeah. only 17 years of age. So straight away, the first team players realised it. Yeah. And he's big, he's strong, he's aggressive. 
The only one thing I didn't have was experience of playing at the highest level. But um, it wasn't long then before I actually did did get in the team. I was only just 18, and I ended up playing 50 odd games for Luton, and then had that had that move to Arsenal at 19. Yeah, yeah brilliant. <clears throat> wow. So should we go on to the centre halves? Yeah, centre halves. Yeah. I'm just enjoying this. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> well, my right side centre half. Again, I'll, I've gone with a player that for me is an inspirational uh, man. Um, my inspiration, because when I joined Arsenal, this man was an alcoholic. And um, I was actually on the training ground one day and he lined all the lads up together. And he said, lads, I'm going to need your help. And we're all going, where's this going, you know? We're all thinking, and it was Tony Adams. And he said, I'm an alcoholic and I'm going to need your help. And he said, come on, let's get on with training. And I believe he's not had a drink since. Wow. And he set up the Sporting Chance Clinic down in Southampton, where he's helped and guided thousands of young footballers and young athletes with all different problems, mental health, drugs, drink, uh, gambling. And he's an incredible man and he was an even better football player. When I, when I went to Arsenal, he was Arsenal captain and he was England captain. And the respect that he commanded in the dressing room was just incredible. And it, it was Tony Adams, um, a beast of a player. Uh, a, a genuinely good guy would help anybody but um, talking about being aggressive there you know you ask Alan Shearer his toughest opponent Tony Adams Chris Sutton his toughest opponent Tony Adams you know he was a monster on the park um, very successful captain him and George Graham worked brilliant together in terms of manager captain George helped him as well with his struggles and everything else um, so <clears throat> I can't speak uh, higher of of, um, of Big Tony Adams. So he would, without doubt, be my right-sided centre-half and he would also be my captain. I mean, excellent choice. And I mean, being a centre-half myself, I mean, I probably wasn't as tough as Tony. But I mean, I, I, you know, as you know, I mean, I'd like to have a right good go, Johnny. But I think being yourself a one of those strikers who loved the, the, the contact. If, yeah. if you're playing against, I mean, if you would rather play against someone, it would be someone of like a softer touch of someone who was more, a bit of a, as we call in our day, it was like a fanny as a centre half. You know what I mean? Someone who was just yeah. thought they would look good in the ball rather than like a Tony Adams who would like yeah. go toe to toe. So well, well, generally, Mark, they were the ones that I had great competition with. No disrespect. To the smaller ones, you know, right. and I'll name it through Gareth Southgate. So Gareth mm -hmm. wasn't the physical presence of Tony Adams. Gareth was a nice centre half, but he was a nice centre half. And I could lean against Gareth mm -hmm. and I could win headers and I could get it onto my chest. He couldn't cope with my physicality. Yeah. Tony Adams could, Razor Ruddock could, you would have, um, Steve Bruce would have, Gary Pallister would have, Colin Hendry would have. These guys, the guys my size, my weight, my physique, those were the games that I did not struggle in, but I used to enjoy. The smaller centre-halves, like the Chris Perrys, even, yeah. even the Jamie Carragher's, for, for the yeah. great centre-half that Jamie was, won, you know, won Champions Leagues at Liverpool. Jamie used to hate playing against myself because I was too yeah. big. He'd have a nightmare. He's thinking, oh my God. And it was the same. There was a lot of big strikers around at the time. You look at the likes of Heskey. You look at the likes of Mark Viduka, Alan Shearer. These types, you know, players yeah. don't like playing the big, strong types, you know. I, 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 so I, I, when I played against Tony, the one thing mm. Tony never let me do was back into him. Right. He was clever. Because if I backed into him and felt him, I had him. I had him. You know, yeah. I knew where he was. He would almost push me forward. And when the ball came into it, he'd either try and get around the side and just get a toe to it. Or right. he'd, he'd, he'd kick the ball, he'd kick it through my legs. He'd put his foot through my legs and kick the ball away. And that frustrated yeah. me. Yeah. Then he got the manager saying, John, get hold of the ball. Get yeah. hold of the ball. So Tony would never let me feel him. And I right. like to feel them. I like, I, like, I like to touch them so I knew where they were. You know? Yeah. 
But even though, even though we're talking about your side, I mean, I would, I'm not being disrespectful to him. I've played against, um, and you it was your strike partner, um, Chris Sutton, when he was yes. at Norwich. And, and so, but again, he was good in the air, but he didn't have that presence, what you had, where if I'm, if I'm like thinking, who would I rather play against? It'd be Chris, because he wasn't as aggressive. Like we, we spoke about this. I can talk about Shearer. He was aggressive yeah. and, and talk about you and, Duncan Ferguson, these are yeah, players now who really yeah. and attack the ball. He was aggressive yeah. in the air. As a, and I didn't see too many people in their day, right, when he was at Man United, yap stamp, give him a tough time. I knew, I watched a game on Sky and I was thinking, he hated yeah. playing against you. He was the same size as you, but because yeah. of your... I played yap ball, stamp at Old Trafford, yeah. Playing against big yeah. yap, again, strong, Absolutely. yeah. Yes, yeah. But what, one of the reasons for that, Marv, was a friend of both of ours. Because when I was an apprentice at Luton, I watched Mick Halford. Yeah. And Mick was, was another yeah. one. Mick was an aggressive header of the ball. A fantastic yeah. player. And people talk about Mick Halford. They talk about his aggressiveness. And, you know, he was this and that. And, you know, blah, blah, blah. But don't think for a minute he wasn't a fantastic centre forward. Oh. Mick would pull off the defender. Yeah. He'd come across people. His touch was outstanding. Uh, he's yeah. always available that, that, that diagonal. Yeah. He was a great foil for Steenie and he'd knock things down, as you know. Yeah. He was a top class centre forward. But he also liked the physicality of the game. I think yeah. I think maybe now the the rules and everything, you know, and um they're trying to take the physicality out of the game, Marv. I think the game and has gone are. soft. It's yeah, gone it soft. And um uh, you can't really challenge for the ball. Now you you, you miss a tackle, you're slight sort of half a second late for a challenge yeah. and you yeah. just catch somebody. It's not a, a, like, that's my first one, ref. Okay, watch yourself, no more yellow card. You're off now. Yeah. You potentially, you're off in the first minute for a, phys, for a physical, hard, aggressive challenge. You know, so, um, and I used to watch Mick in games. I wouldn't watch the game. I'd watch yeah. Mick. I'd watch his yeah. movements and I'd watch how he got across the centre forward how we sort of went in, left the forward in and pulled right away. And I always yeah. felt when the fullbacks were hitting it, I always said, go long so I can arc my run and come right yeah. down the back rather than trying to maybe be, be clever and just drop it in because sometimes I hated the balls when they were under hit. I'd always right. say, the other left side centre off, I'd say, look, yeah. go long, almost yeah. hit for the, for, the, for the left back position because I could run, make make my run arc it as wide as I could, you know. And I used to watch Mick and they didn't come more aggressive than the big fella, as you know. <laughs> I, I was and, very um, grateful when um when I lined up with Mick after the team when I used to watch videos of him when he was at Birmingham and with those likes of Noel Blake and uh, whoa, I mean I they was told very us fortunate. to calm down. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, if you play the fight aside with Mick now he catch someone. He couldn't help himself. No, he couldn't. He couldn't. He'd have he to couldn't. leave it on somebody, wouldn't he? Yeah, he would. He would, and that was and that was, and that was the best thing him. about it. It's, it's, it's just in him. It's just yeah. in him. It's just in him. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, no, so left side. No, it, it was Tony Adams, and it was um, and it was Dixie Julian Dix, um, Lee Dixon, and the goalie. The other side was I couldn't leave this boy out because he came through when I was at West Ham. Um, he actually made his debut in the game that I was playing in. Ferdinand. Um, in midfield. Ferdinand. Made his debut Ferdinand. in midfield. And right. then he went on to become one of the best centre halves in the world. Um, yeah. And you just got him in one there, Rio Ferdinand. Yeah. He, had, he had feet like a midfield player. He was six foot two. Um, he could come out from the back. He could run in behind. He could head it. He could be aggressive if he needed to, like if he was up against a tough one. Um, and uh, he went on to have a magnificent career. I think he had 80, 90 odd, I'm not sure how many, but he had, he had bundles of caps for England, played in World Cups, magnificent for Manchester United. I think he's got two Champions League winners' medals, yeah. broke records. I think he was the record signed in for Leeds, left West Ham for 30 million, went to Leeds, and then he had an unbelievable career at United alongside Vidic and um, playing with the likes of Scholes and Keane and Cole and York and Beckham and all these great players' gigs. Um, 
and a lovely lad as well. I've just I've just come away from the agency that he runs because I've been with them for two or three years, and I'm just up in Edinburgh and things change and things like that. But uh, no, he's been good as gold to me, Rio, um, and always you know always um, very infectious when you see him. You know, always right. asks you how, how you are. He's a really nice yeah. lad. He's got great grounding. He's been brought up well, and when I when I see him now. His morals are still exactly the same. I always oh, say to you, never change, Rio. Never that's change, fantastic. mate, because you're, you're a wonderful human being. And, um, you know, so the other centre-half would have to be, and I think what a partnership they would be. Oh, great. Ferdinand and Adams, yeah. you know, playing as a central pairing. So I had to put Rio Ferdinand. He, he was different class. And, and funny enough, you talk, I think, I'm sure he went to, before he played, made his debut, he went to Bournemouth on loan. And... Funny enough, we played against him, and this is when no one heard about him. And another okay. mate of yours, Forpy, Forpy playing up front, and Mitchell, we're playing like in the back. And he had, I mean, no one heard from him. He's a young kid. He had Forpy in his pocket. And I remember coming in after the game, and, um, you know, as you do, you're going, you're going home and you're talking about the game. And, and you know what Mitch was like? Mitch was going, well, Forpy, I can't believe that kid, that little boy from West Ham, had you in his pocket, and that little boy turns out to be Rio Ferdinand. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, again, I mean, fantastic player, unbelievable. Yeah, well, Harry, player. Used, Harry used to do that. He sent Frank Lampard on loan to Swansea, and he sent Jermaine Defoe on loan to Bournemouth as well. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, I'm not too sure whether Joe Cole went out anywhere, but uh, that they, that that team that I, I played for at West Ham, the younger lads. The likes of um, Lampard, Defoe, uh, Michael Carrick, um, Rio, Cole, they, went, they won the FA Youth Cup that year. So we, we got a taste of how good these young players were coming through. And Harry was great in terms of giving these kids a chance. Yeah. But not only did he give them a chance, but he knew they were ready. They, they were fantastic yeah. players. Yeah. I remember, I remember Rio, really Rio, saying once, Rio saying once that one of his biggest educations that he had was when, similar to the story I was saying about Luton 10 minutes ago, when, when uh, Harry used to bring some of the youth team players over, Rio Ferdinand being one of them, <clears throat> he would be up against myself in my prime and Ian Dowie. And he was like, we just used to knock the living daylights, you know, <laughs> go in, challenges. And, and Rio said it was the best education that I ever could have. Because if I can play against these two monsters on a true. Friday morning, going forward, I can handle anything, you know. That's true. And the physicality, Big Downer was physical, wasn't he? Like yeah. to get across people. Yeah. And Rio said that, he's, he said that on record. So, um, no, fantastic. as I said, I, I, couldn't, um, I, I couldn't leave him a wonderful player and a great man as well. Excellent. So the back four's in place. Excellent, it is. And um, so we'll pause it there um, and then we'll be just for a small um, ad break for, with our sponsors and then we'll be back after the break. JB Developments Luton Limited are the new home kit sponsors of the Luton Town Hatters. Specialising in extensions, home renovations, patios, driveway enhancements, all aspects of landscaping. Our goal is to assist local residents, whether it be home improvements or commercial property developments, while providing building excellence. Call us on 01525 868 250 to discuss your projects or visit jbdevelopmentslimited.com to find out more. Come on, you hatters! Thanks very much for that. So we're back here. Um, those people haven't heard so far. We've got John Hartson, um, who has given us his best 11 so far in goal. We've got David Seaman, um, right back uh, Lee Dixon, left back Julian Dix and centre backs Tony Adams and Rio. We're now gone for three midfield and three up front. And this is where it gets interesting. So I'll hand back over to John to start us off with his um, midfielders, which I'm very, very intrigued to see. Is he going to go West Ham, Arsenal, Celtic, or even a, even a couple of Luton players in there? So we'll have to wait and see. All right. Well, I've changed my mind. <laughs> I've gone for 4 2 3 one. Four, two, three, one. Go on, four, two, three, one. Well, it's in fashion like at the moment. It's in fashion at the moment. It's four, two, yeah, three, one. I've gone for four, two, three, one. So, 
The next player I would have sitting in front of the back four would be Roy. Uh, I'd, I'd give this one away. It would be Roy. No, King. I didn't hear it. Oh, Roy King. Oh, okay. okay. Well, Roy, Roy came to Celtic um, towards the end of his career. I think a lot of the Republic of Ireland boys, Irish internationals, they grew up supporting Celtic. It's like a boyhood ambition for them to play for Celtic. You've just seen Shane Duffy sign for Celtic this week. Yeah. Robbie Keane came on loan. Um, we've had lots of other Republic of Ireland players, ex-players. And um, Roy came for the last sort of six months of his career. And um, just to play with Roy, he's somebody that I'd admired, great player, um, would probably be in a lot of people's teams in terms of what he achieved at Manchester United, leading the team to leagues and cups and everything else. And the way he was so unselfish that year where he came back and he, he knew he'd, he'd missed the final against Juventus. I think he got booked. And the yeah. way that he continued, I think Manchester United went 2-0 down that night. He, he committed a foul. He knew he'd missed the final. And he, he was just like a, a man possessed, just trying to get his team yeah. into the final, which he achieved. They came back at 1-3-2. And he knew, he knew he'd missed the final. So things like that, I think, stick out with me in terms of his character, you know, and his principles, what it meant to him. Unselfish um, team player. And... Um, at Celtic, again, he was fantastic. We, we didn't know what to expect. You don't never know what to expect. Yeah, I was going to ask that because you, all you see on TV is the gruff personality. You occasionally see the smirk. Angry man, yeah. Yeah, what, what's he like, like on the John? training pitch? Yeah. What's he, yeah, what's he like? He, he was great. Um, I shared that we used, to, we used to go to Celtic Park every morning. Our training ground was about a mile up the road. So we get changed at Celtic Park and then we jump in the cars and go to the training ground and then come back after training. But I shared, shared lifts a few times with Roy, jumped in with me, I jumped in with him the next day. And he was good as gold. He uh, never caused any problems. Um, we had some characters in the dressing room as well. You know, we had some big characters in there ourselves, like Lennon and Thompson and myself and Sutton and these guys as well, which we would all had decent careers ourselves and lot similar ages. Um, but no, he was great. He was great with the young players. Uh, Gordon Strachan brought him in. He was fine with Gordon. It was never an issue. I think he played, I don't know, I'm guessing, probably the back end of about 20-odd games for us. Um, and he was great. As I said, it was one of them things where when I was on the pitch with him, um, it was a case of, although I played for my country, I played with some wonderful players, I, was, I always thought to myself, I'm sharing a picture with Roy Keane. That's how much adulation I had for him, right. you know. And I never had that for maybe other players because I thought to yeah. myself, well, I'm all right. I'm in this team. I deserve to be in this team. I'm, I'm at my level here. When Roy came, I'm thinking, he's a superstar, you know, a real superstar and a great lad, you know, great personality. Um, so, uh, as I said, Roy for certain would, would uh, be in front of my back four yeah. you know, in terms of one of them two sort of right. holders, if you like. Right. And the other Good one, choice. the other one, um, so I've got Roy Keane sitting and the other one I've got as part of that two in front of the back four, um, went through a bit of an illness himself towards the end of his career, um, needed some help. He got leukemia. He showed incredible battling, you know, skills, um, adversity, um, and he was a fantastic player. He's Bulgarian. Oh, and, um, oh Stylian Petrov. Yes. Stylian Petrov, yeah. You got him. Yeah. You got him. Stylian Petrov was yeah. a genius. Uh, what an incredible player he was. He trained every day like he played. He'd be yeah. sweating pints every day when he'd just cover every blade of grass. His, his appetite for the game was just remarkable. Yeah, skills, unbelievable skills, great on the ball, could go right, left foot, scored wonderful goals. And again, a nicer man you would never wish to meet or be around. Um, you know, came close, a near-death experience, obviously, with, with getting leukaemia. He fought really hard to beat it. 
Um, and we still speak. We still speak all the time. He, uh, he went on to, he followed Martin O'Neill down to Aston Villa, became Aston Villa captain. He was Celtic. He was a wonderful player for five years at Celtic with myself and all the other guys. So a player that I've got great admiration for and, and, and worthy of being in my best 11. Is so I'd have to go with Keane and Petrov. Um, fantastic. Two, two fantastic players. Do you think that changes a man? Um, obviously, I know you've been through it as well yourself. Um, do you think of being a player, when you go through it as a player, do you think it changes your your kind of view on playing? Do you think it brings more enjoyment and you see less as a job or, or does it not make any difference? Well, towards my, my own experiences, you know, I, I was almost retiring anyway, but um, it, it totally changes you as a person. You know, getting cancer myself, you know, it's, it's given me a different perception of life now because it all nearly got taken away from me. Yeah. And when, I had, when I was diagnosed with testicular cancer that spread to my lungs and to my brain, I needed two brain operations over 70 sessions of chemotherapy and I spent six weeks in hospital fighting for my life. And I know still young Stan Petro went through a similar experience when he went into hospital, um, got an, an awful lot of treatment, um, had, to, had to then commit to a programme which was going to help him get better in terms of the medication and everything that he was given. Um, You've got to be incredibly positive and uh, ultimately you need that little bit of luck as well. But it's changed me as a person, you know, coming through that illness. It's the simple things now for me. It's the simple things in life. It's having nice times with my wife and my children and walking along a beach, you know, and just realising them. These great moments that don't cost anything, you know, and they all nearly got so taken away from me, you know. So that's when you have a different perception of things then. Yeah. And it's a shame it takes that type of experience, yeah. you know, to, to do that. Um, you can't be the same. It'll never be the same in terms of what I was like before cancer since I've had it. You know, it always changes every cancer survivor out there. Um, what it does to your family in terms of makes you closer. Because um, I think when you get that scare, when, when, when you think that, you know, you nearly lost everything, you nearly went, um, and, and, then, and when you get that opportunity to, 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 to go again, you know, you've been blessed with a, I don't like to say second chance, a second bite at life, if you like. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's, it's got to change you. And uh, it certainly has given me a different outlook on things, you know, and, um, and I would imagine it's been exactly the same for Stylian Petrov. He, Paulina is his Bulgarian wife. And his two boys as well. I know we know what it would have meant to his family. Um, so as I said, it, it, it's got to have changed you, and and of course it's, it's changed you for for the better. You know. No, excellent. And we and we're, and we're going to like come to the bit of that towards the end when we talk about what you're actually doing now, because we do know that you're doing a lot of charity work and stuff as, as well. So we want to like make sure that all the listeners get to understand what charities and where to help out. So. Moving on to the free, in the, is it the free yeah. attackers, yeah? Four, two, three, one. So I've got the two um, players in front of the back four. So on the right-hand side, I am going to put in um, Dennis Bergkamp. Yes. I'm going to put him on the right because um, Dennis could play anywhere. He could play through the middle. He could play as a number 10. He could come in from the right, which he didn't do that much could even play left side of the, he, he's so clever. I always say, if Dennis Bergkamp ever played in the snow, he wouldn't, he wouldn't leave any footprints. <laughs> he was that good. He was so balanced and his weight of pass, his appreciation of his teammates around him, he was just on a different planet to everything else. Um, in terms of just just his, his pure natural ability and his appreciation. Um, you've seen the goals that he scored, but he created double the goals that he scored. But, you know, if you watch a video, I saw it last week, when he was putting on read through and he was putting yeah. he runs through and he was, it's freakish. And he was putting Ian right through. Yeah. It's just, 
you know, the defenders are, are, are behind him and he's like lifting and he's flicking and he's and he's sliding balls through like the, you know, the eye through the eye of a needle passes with the correct weight. And I think the weight of pass is underappreciated. Yeah. To play a pass with the right weight so it gets there right at the time through the centre forward, comes on to it, doesn't have to break his stride, doesn't need a touch, can do it first time. Um, and Dennis, there was nobody better at that. Um, and he was a lovely guy as well. Bruce Rioch brought him to Arsenal uh, for, I think it was about seven million from Inter Milan. And uh, there were times where me and Whitey played as a pairing up top and Dennis played in behind in the hall. It was a joy again to play with Bergkamp. Um, and a nice fella, really nice, very humble, very quiet. Didn't turn up with a big entourage. He had his wife and little small kids. Mum and dad would often come over. Um, he lived in a place called Cock Foster's. I lived in Potter's Bar out in Hertfordshire. So we, you know, we, we lived quite close to each other as well uh, while we were both at Arsenal. And he was just um, a great player and a great man. But um, again, Dennis Bergkamp, you know, Excellent. how could you pick him out? I know, excellent choice. And going back to what you just said there, I mean, you played with him at Arsenal. You yeah. went there as a 19-year-old, Johnny. And I, we mentioned this the other day, Andrew and I, when we was talking to another guest. For a 19-year-old to go, which at the time was a British transfer record for a teenager. Yeah, the most expensive teenager. Most yeah. expensive, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You're 19 and you're not, and really, you're not really, I mean, yes, you had played probably about 40 or 50 games for Luton at the time, but still at a young age, that's to go to a club of Arsenal stature and to, I mean, I mean I'm paying you credit to you now to be ground because so many kids could have gone the other way and gone, mm -hmm. I'm, now, I'm now a multi-millionaire or whatever. I don't know what money he was on, but it, for a 19-year-old and basically just go off the rails. I mean, for you to be ground, like you said, I think you mentioned a little bit about it when you was at Luton, get me in that first team. Get, I think that was what you probably had at Arsenal now is that, mm -hmm. I'm now a bigger club, yeah. I belong here. Yes. Well, I think you've got to think like that, Marv, even if, even if you don't. You've yes. got to try and... You know, point going into training and being a little bit uh, in awe of these people and looking up to people. Yes, you can respect them, but hold on a minute. I'm, I've come to Arsenal to play. I want to play. I don't admire these people. I can admire them when I retire, like now. But yeah. I'm here. I'm 19. I'm energetic. I'm full of energy. I'm full of spunk. I'm full of... I've got desire, I've got hunger, I, I'm a fighter, I, I want to play. I don't sit on the bench. You train yeah. all week to peak on a weekend. That was always my attitude. You train, you want to play. It's a short career. Get as many games in as you can. And one of the reasons why I left Arsenal, I got offered a new contract by Arsene Wenger, David Dean as well, um, because I'd had a red nap on the phone at the time offering me a chance to go and play for West Ham and play every single week. He said, John, I will build my team around you. I'm 21 at Arsenal, I've had two years at the club. And to be fair, I've got the best tour on the planet at the time. Ian White was the England centre forward. Dennis Bergkamp was a genius for Holland, you know, his, his national team. And I'm thinking, 21, John Artson, come from Luton, I want to play. You know, and I never, never saw eye to eye. I, I, didn't, I didn't have many arguments with managers, but one of them was Bruce Rioch. I never quite, I never quite got it with Bruce. We never quite, um, I don't know, we never showed each other that much love and that respect as maybe you need um, when you're young. Um, I thought he was a bit, uh, you know, he wouldn't put his arm around me. He would never say, well done. And I, I'm a little bit insecure in that. I still am today. If I if I do well, if I do something, I say, you know, I like to be said by someone to say to me, "Oh, that was good. You did well there." Um, when I've done so much television now, I always like the, you know, the uh, the editors or the producers when I come off the show to go, "Hey, John, well done there, man. I thought you nailed that bit. I thought you did well there." So if they don't say it, I'm driving all the way home thinking, "How how did I do there? What I get on next week?" You know, um, yeah. I am still a bit shy, and I'm very much like it then, but. Uh, you know, at that particular time, it was a, it was a mag magnificent move for me. You know, George Graham paying all that money, 2.5 million, in 1995. Yeah. 25 years ago now. I know. But you know, there's a lot that, of money. That was, gonna be, 
Yeah, like, yeah, but that was going to be a little bit about my point. You, you've come from Luton now, and uh, you know there would have been Arsenal scholars similar of age who were looking, thinking, well, he's come. No, again, obviously I was Luton all my career. He's come from Luton. I'm at yeah. Arsenal, and I'm not playing. They're paying two point five million for this kid. And so it must have been difficult for them, some of them, I suppose, thinking, wow, yeah. you know? It's quite funny, Mark, because um, I remember, I think we were playing Barnsley on the Saturday for Luton. Um, at the end of the training at Electrolux there on the rugby, on the rugby pitches, you know, at, at the side of the golf course, wasn't it? Stockton yeah. Park. Um, <clears throat> I remember I was playing well, I was flying. I think I scored the week before against South End or might have been Middlesbrough or something like that. I remember we beat Middlesbrough 5 0 once. Yeah, um, that's the yeah. end. Ellenworth Road. Great performance from us. Little Dwight Marshall scored. Dwight a Marshall. Yeah. Oaksy and everything. And um, I remember training on the Friday, and David Pleats said to me, pulled me after training, and he, our manager, of course, for the listeners. He said, um, John, can you um, come and see me after training? And I went, yeah, of course, of course, boss, yeah. So I'm thinking now, um, he's going to drop me. <laughs> and I was 19, and Marvel will tell you, I was quite boisterous, so I was quite out there, you know. And I thought, I was getting myself all right up. If he, if he, if he drops me, if he says he's going to go with the wig, you know, Kenny Dixon, or if he's going to go with somebody else, and I'm going to be ready for it. I've already phoned my dad. My dad had wound me up. said, yeah, you tell him, son, you tell him. So I banged on his door. He said, come in. I called him in. And he said, look, John, he said, um, he said I'd like you to go home, have a shave, Put a suit on. He said, "We're going to go to. We're going to go meet George Graham." This was a Friday afternoon after training. I didn't have a clue, so I'm like, "Wow!" So I went home and I didn't have a tie. I didn't have a jacket, so I borrowed it off my landlord. And if you watch the pictures today of me and Chris Kuomia uh, alongside George on the day that I signed, I had this little Mickey Mouse old tie on with a grey old jacket that I borrowed off my landlord, right? That's all I had. So uh, on the way, I didn't have an agent at the time. So I go back to meet David Pleat, all the way through the A406 from, from Luton down the M1, um, across to, or towards Highbury, Holloway Road and everything else, the old Avenel Road, Highbury. And, um, and David Pleat's phone's going every two minutes I'm, I'm breaking the record I'm pretty so I got a great experience I didn't have an agent you know yeah. so I think Mr. Pleat and George might have done quite well on that one you know <laughs> but, uh, so I'm going in there and his phone's going and everything else and, and George Graham said to me he said look John he said you this is how it is he said uh, I'm selling Kevin Campbell he said uh, I've already had a chat with Kevin Alan Smith has turned his ankle this morning in training Big smudger, was a great player, golden yeah. boot, twice golden boot. He said, if you sign for me today, he said, you will play tomorrow out there. We were like in the boardroom. He said, you will play tomorrow out there with the current England centre forward. Of course, who was Ian Wright. Um, so straight away, I said, well, where's the contract, George? You know? <laughs> so I signed straight away. And that was me, an Arsenal player. It happened that Literally week. like that. So the next day at Luton, I'm getting ready to go home, get on the bus the next day, travel to Barnsley, sit with Precy and all the boys, thought we'd yourself, have a game of cards on the bus up to Luton. The next day, I'm making my debut against Everton. Duncan Ferguson got sent off. I played against Big Nev, my Welsh teammate, and we drew the game 1-1 and rightly scored our goal. That was literally wow. my, my sort of um, welcome to Arsenal. Drew with Everton 1-1. Signed a five-year deal, and I'm 19. That's exactly how it happened. Wow. Yeah. So I was and that, and, go on, Andrew. Any regrets? No, not at all. It was something I had to do. I, I had to do at the sign for such a big club. There was other rumours. There was one or two other clubs that, that were looking at me. But I think the way it happened, I didn't have an agent. It happened so quickly. So I wasn't advised not to go and to go somewhere else. It wasn't about money. It wasn't about, oh, well, I've got this club, John. Nobody was telling me that this club would have paid you more yeah. or whatever. It was George Graham. And it was 25 years ago. And I was 19. I was a young boy. 
Um, so no, absolutely. And I do the same again. Arsenal is an unbelievable football club, a brilliant fan base. They do things right there at Arsenal. And, um, you know, to, to, to not sign for George Graham. You know, George had won the double there as a player and a manager, an absolute legend at the football club. Um, no regrets whatsoever. Had a wonderful two years there at Arsenal. Excellent. Fantastic. Excellent. Uh, so where are we now? We're on the left hand side, is it now, the three? Yeah, I just is want to actually Bur ask you about Burkamp oh, for a second. Um, yeah. Dennis Burkamp, um, he always came across and he's always been um, said in the media as being a very, very quiet, shy guy. Um, he's one of the players who apparently who embraced Arsene Wenger's looking after your body because apparently he was doing it for years before then anyway. Um, what was he like in the dressing room? Was he always the, the quiet, shy guy or was he the boisterous or within, obviously, the characters, like you say, you had Merson, you had Ian Wright, you had Tony Adams, you had some big characters. And when you signed, obviously, you had people like David Platt, um, um, David later on. Came, to, came to the club, yeah. Yeah, I mean, what was it? What was it like there with Burkamp? Was he was he shy? Was he was he Did out he, there? Um, well, if Dennis had anything to say, then he he would put it across the right way. But we we had some we had some really big characters. You know, you you view right to you a mile off before seeing him. You know, in in the training ground, he he was running around. Where's my pin pads? Where's my boots? He'd have, be having a bit of a barney with Moose or one of the other lads. And, Nice in a nice way. I still, what we're doing strikes. Right, he was just wanted to do finishing all the time. He's an <laughs> exceptional goal scorer, you know. Um, but again, really infectious. Right, he just uh, has an impression on you the minute he meets you, you know. Um, so we had big, loud characters. I mentioned Tony Adams. He would, he would almost, you know, tell everybody what it's all about before we went out. You know, this is Highbury. This is our this is our home. Nobody comes here and wins today. You know, we'd all listen to him and um, things like this. We had we had Nige at left back as well. David Seaman used to speak with Ray Parler, Moose, these guys. Dennis just got on with it. But the respect he had within that dressing room, because he was our best player. He's our best player by country miles, like at, at Celtic. A team makes up of a, of a, a team makes up of eleven players, but Henrik Larson was Head and above, shoulders, head, you know, head and shoulders above, and Dennis was the same. And uh, but no, he was a quiet guy. He was um, well spoken, um, do things right. Never really had any headlines, bad headlines. Went home, went home, did his, you know, did his after, you know, the stretching that they needed to do. There was a gym there. You could do a bit of extra weights. Looked after himself. And ultimately, you know, I think he'd come from Inter Milan, where I think in Italy, I think the the sports science and the eating habits and the and the, the drinking and the sessions and all this um, that didn't necessarily happen in in Serie A at that time. You know, they were a great um, nation, Italy, and when he come through what Inter Milan, I played for Inter Milan. I think the the discipline there was a lot better than what we'd seen in the Premier League. Um, that drinking culture that I spoke about and everything else. So that might all have been quite new to Dennis when he joined Arsenal initially. Um, but everybody loved him. He was a great guy, and and he was just as I said, um, there was nothing that he, he couldn't do. Volume, technique, just an outstanding footballer. Outstanding. Excellent. Awesome. So, so we'll move on. Yeah, so what I've done was, so Dennis is going to play on the right. In the middle of the park, I'm going to put a player that I played with at Celtic. Um, he is uh, a Champions League winner, 1997. A midfielder. Oh. Played for Dortmund and marked Zinazdin Zidane out of the game oh. in the European John, Cup final. John Collins? No. No, not John. I, I never played I, with John. I, Although John played for Celtic. Uh, I know what you say, John. Like John Lambert. Lam was it Lambert? Paul Lambert. You're Paul right. Paul Lambert. And I played with Paul. And I, I, I could have put many a player in this position, actually. Um, you know, I mentioned Hughes, I've not mentioned Trevor Sinclair, I've not mentioned Moose and, you know, th these type of players. Um, 
But I've gone with Paul Lambert because you brilliant to me, Paul, as a midfielder. He he'd roll it into the right side of you when he when he won his when he won the tackle. He had an appreciation of the game. Um, he, he he learned an awful lot from being at Dortmund as well. <clears throat> and um, he was captain of Celtic. He was my captain and uh, great leader in the dressing room. And him and Stan Petrov and Neil Lennon in the middle of the park for Celtic were a fabulous three. Um, and then we had Thompson and a cat and obviously myself, Larson Sutton through the middle. So we had a really good side at Celtic, but Paul Lambert was instrumental in keeping all that neat and tidy. The dress room was always somebody that, you know, we all respected, trained well, did the right thing. And he was a fantastic football player. Again, a European Cup winner. Um, so I, I, I would go with Paul Lambert in the middle of, you know, as, as four, two, three, I put Paul Lambert there. And he could switch with Keith, uh, with uh, Petrov. Petrov liked to get forward, get goals. Lambo would sit in. Petrov would go. Then Petrov would sit in. Lambert would go. They were so clever, and they had so much nose about them as footballers. They never, they never got un, you know overloaded in terms of defensively, uh, overrun if you like. They were always very clever. Good balance to the team. So Paul Lambert would get my spot in the middle of the three. Excellent, and it and like you mentioned earlier on, he was at Dortmund um, and yeah. was at uh, Champions League when I was he at Dortmund. Did you say he was? Yeah, yeah. he was. Um, and that was at the time when now you've got it's fashionable now with um, the English guy Sancho being yeah. there at Dortmund That's and right. um, Klopp came from there to Liverpool, didn't he? Did yeah, well Jude, 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 the lad from Birmingham just gone to Dortmund yeah, as well. Bellingham, Bellingham, Bellingham yeah. yes. And, and now yeah. when it was Lambert, it was not as fashionable. And we're talking well, about well, Lambert the was there, you had, you had the boy Sammer there, the, the great German, the ginger-headed yeah. player, um, the likes of... Um, you had Rick Rickson as well, and he Rick, ended up at Rangers. Riedler, Riedler was, was there, the boy... Um, was, was, the Lars, was, was Lars Rickson there? The port, was he Portuguese, Lars Rickson? Who ended up at um, Rangers for a while. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, but some really I good think players. I'm to my championship manager day. Sorry. <laughs> 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 yeah. So uh, no, again, he, he brought that great experience, and he was a brilliant footballer. You know, running with the ball, he'd make yards. Not the biggest, not the tallest, not the most aggressive, not the quickest, but just a great midfielder all right. round. Somebody that you could put in the team of, and and you could rely on him. You know, you could right. rely on him to just go and do a great job. But he was. He was always eight, eight out of ten every week. You need them players, and that's and that's what the Germans love, and they something reliable. You mean that it makes? I mean, it makes oh, sense no. that they they went and got him all them years back because, like you've just explained there, reliable and eight out yeah. of ten every week. Typical German, exactly. and, and and that's what you want. You want that consistency. You know, I always talk about these great players, and the great players do it year in, year out. Um, score. Next season, they're not looking to, you know, put themselves on a pedestal. They're just driven, hurricane driven, year in, year out, performances, just wants to do things, wants to get better, wants to make himself better. Right, he was never happy with scoring 30 goals. He wanted 35 goals, then he wanted 36 the next season. Players like Henry Larson, who, who was fabulous, never rested on what they'd achieved. They just had attitudes like nothing else wanted to become even better, wanted to train harder, wanted to learn more, you know, these type of things. Paul Lambert, you know, epitomised that attitude. Yeah. You, you say he's your, he, was, he was your captain at Celtic. Um, obviously managing at the moment. Um, yeah. and I know he's had a few ups and downs with management in terms of mm -hmm. successes and not successes. Do you see him moving north? I don't know because he's down at uh, he's managing Ipswich at the minute, yeah. and he's a former manager in Norwich. He got two promotions at Norwich. He was also at Livingston. He was at Aston Villa. He was at. That's Wickham. what I mean. Yeah, he's had he's had some yeah. ups and downs. He had several jobs, Paul. Um, but I think I think he would be looking at getting some success with Ipswich now. Um, I think that's what his thinking would be. You know, in terms of taking Ipswich out of the championships. Yeah, up to the championship into the Premier League in recent seasons they've seen their big rivals Norwich do that been like a bit of a yo-yo club up down they've yeah. gone up last year they went down again now the season just gone so they're playing championship football at the minute so at Ipswich so I think Paul's focus would be to take Ipswich 
as high as he can and be successful and take them into the Premier League. What, what an achievement that would be to have done it with Norwich and Ipswich. You know, yeah. I don't know what type of budget they've got there. Oh, Mick McCarthy was there for many years, wasn't he? Um, for a few years anyway, Mick Roy Keane had a little spell at Ipswich. So Paul is there now, and I wouldn't have thought Paul is the type of guy to, to take his mind off too many things. He's, he's, he's very driven, he's very focused, and um, you know, I wish him well, of course, because he was a great player, and he's done well. He's had spells in management where he's been successful, not so well, but he's still in there, and um, you know, he's got the knowledge anyway. He's got the knowledge, and, and he's got the experience of taking of taking knowledge, you know, uh, through promotions. He's done it before, so that's why I would think uh, Ipswich still believe in him. Yeah, interesting. Fantastic. So we'll go left side then. Let's keep going. Left side is, um, this one. This one goes without saying. You know, my Welsh counterpart, the most decorated footballer in British football history. Um, a freak of nature, if you like, you know, um, rapid, Man United's record appearance yeah. holder. Yeah. Nearly, nearly 200 goals, I think, for Man United. Trophy after right. trophy after trophy after trophy. Fergie sold everybody, got rid of everybody, apart from one man. Brian Giggs. Giggs. Yeah. Pep Giggs, all his yeah. career. Hughes, Kuchelskis, Beckham. And Mr. Roy gone. He knows when he gets the best out of people, and then Sir Alex knows when to trade them off, get the right money in, bring other players. And I think he built three or four different teams at Man United. Sir Alex Ferguson, successful teams, and Ryan Giggs was in every one of his teams. Yeah. So that yeah. says a lot about him. Um, lucky I played with Ryan for ten years with the national team. The front three was Giggs, Hudson, Bellamy. That was our front three at the time, and the Mark Hughes. Um, great lad again um, doing now doing great things as well with the Welsh team they've won their first two games Finland and Bulgaria in, in the Nations League um, you know and whenever I see him again we have a good catch up we had some great times with the national team over the years but um, well, what, what can I say about him as a player what can I say he's just marvel you'd have played against him wouldn't you Gigsy? yeah 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 just yeah just yeah yeah Quick. Light, lightning Lightning, oh, yes. Yeah. scorer. And I think towards the end of his career, I think he played until he was 39, I think. He went in centre midfield, just yeah. slowed down a little bit in terms of his running power, but still had the ability yeah. to control the football and, 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 and to go into that central area and keep the ball moving and, and obviously guide and advise the younger ones coming through. Um, and he's gone into management. He's gone into the Welsh team. Doesn't surprise me. He's a Welsh legend. And... Uh, you know, as I said, I, again, there's certain players in that team that yeah. I've mentioned, the, the, the Adamses and the Keens, you know, the Burke Camps. Um, and again, Ryan Giggs is one that I just could not leave out. You know, right. <clears throat> I, I just want to touch on that um, that Welsh um, connection, obviously, you playing with, him, with your country. You... I think you mean the old one of the records, one of the only four players who scored in a hat trick in the 21s and stuff. But I want to more focus like your full first cap for Wales and what that was like to be called up and how, how was that experience and what, how did you find out and stuff like that? Yeah. Well, Marv, as you know, I'm, I'm a very proud Welshman. You know, very patriotic. Um, I'm proud of where I come from, although I've lived in London, and I've lived in Hertfordshire, I've lived in. Glasgow, now I'm living in Edinburgh. <clears throat> my family are in Wales. Um, my parents and people have lots and lots of great friends. Um, so when I was first called up, it was Bulgaria away in Sofia, 1995. Same year as I signed for Arsenal. Wow. And um, again, the problem I had was I had three superstars ahead of me. I had Rush, Hughes and uh, Saunders. And these guys were just all playing 60, 70 caps, all leading the line for their respective clubs, great clubs. Um, but again, I was quite lucky because Rushy retired and Sparky retired. And then I ended up going on a bit of a run and I played a lot of games with Dean Saunders. Yeah. And uh, Dean, like myself, he's a Swansea lad, great, great lad, um, great footballer as well. Um, but it was a very proud moment, obviously, getting my first cap. I went on then to win 51 senior caps 
um, played under Mark Hughes, John Toshak, one of my idols. I watched John take Swansea up the up the leagues, centre forward, Liverpool, Keegan, Toshak, that partnership. Um, so, you know, Marv, out of all the, the, the things I've been very lucky to achieve, um, you know, the goals and the cups and things like that, the biggest thing I've ever, ever done in my life is represent my country at senior level. That is the proudest yeah. moment because you cannot go higher than yeah. representing your country at senior level. I don't care what anybody says. Yeah. People can say Premier Leagues, which is a great achievement. People can say Champions Leagues, unbelievable to win a Champions League. What, what a great honour that is to have a Champions League winner's medal you know, on your CV when you retire. But for me personally, um, a Welsh speaker from Swansea, the heart of Wales, parents speak Welsh, brothers, sisters, went to a Welsh school, um, putting on that shirt, putting on that red jersey with number nine on the back for 10 years, you know, uh, took that shirt off Rush Hughes and, and players before that, John yeah. Charles, Trevor yeah. Ford. You know, these great players that have worn that shirt for Wales and to have done that, um, was I was immensely proud. And I always say to people that for me personally, I'm not just representing me when I, when I play for Wales. I'm representing my, my heritage. Yeah. I'm doing that for my kids. I'm doing that for my father, my grandfather, my great grand. You're representing your whole country. I was the best centre forward in my country for 10 years the best number nine yeah. for 10 years and there's nobody better i proved you, that with them caps you know yeah. so did you captain them as well did you captain them as well captain was you captain, captain a few on, my, on my on my 50th cap yeah my golden cap um trying to think what it is <laughs> yeah <laughs> i mean it shows you my golden cap then no, i don't know it, it, wow. it was just, yeah, I captained them once on my 50th cap, and then John Tosh was in charge, and I think we played uh, Slovakia, I think, at the Betchfield, Swansea's home ground. Um, so, no, it's, it's you know, it, it means, I think it means more to some people than others. But uh, for me, for the reasons I've just said, yeah. um, playing for Wales was meant everything to me. I wish I'd won more caps. I, I probably could have. I picked up one or two injuries. Um, everything else and I, I know Rush Hughes and Saunders probably held me back a little bit but they were three greats of Welsh football but um, no it was it was certainly uh, the highlight the highlight of my career yeah. really I was. know I, and I bet Big Cyril was like beaming when he when you got your first oh, one I can imagine so you can imagine from a father's <laughs> point of view if your son my yeah. son went and played and 72,000 people and the anthem and you're looking down and all them trips up to up to Luton as a young boy, yeah. all them trains with Kerry Hughes and Pem and all these lads. My dad would drop me off, I'd get the train up and he'd say to Pem, make sure you look after him now, Mark, when he gets to... I, I used to look after Pem on the pitch then. I, I went sort of reversed, you know. <laughs> but, um, and obviously to see your son then to go on and represent the country and to be there. He's obviously a very, very proud man, like like proud. we all would be of, of our son if he went on and, and represented his country. Big Cyril yeah. was everywhere, yeah. Big Cyril loved it, fantastic. Yeah. Awesome. So, so you say that um, representing Wales was the biggest moment in your um, for yourself uh, yeah. as a player. Um, I'm interested. You're a very proud Welshman. Um, did you ever try and get back to Swansea to play for Swansea? Obviously, being your boyhood club, uh, so you support. Um, did you ever try to do that, or was it never came up? Or would you? I, have I'd always to... said, I'd always said that I would love to have had some time at Swansea as a player. <clears throat> the problem I had was was that when I was at Arsenal and when I was at West Ham at 21, 19, 23, Wimbledon, Coventry, Celtic, 26, 27, 28. With no disrespect to Swansea, they were in the second uh, division. Yeah. yeah, Third division, championship at times under Roberto Martinez. So when I was in my prime at Arsenal, doing really well, playing in Europe and everything else, Swansea were like, so the timing was never compatible in terms of me going to the club. Um, which in a way, it's not a regret because listen, you know, it, things happen for a reason and maybe mm, it wasn't yeah. meant to happen. But I would have loved to have represented my hometown club. 
you know, I probably know a lot of the lads in the stand and in the stadium. I'd grown up, went to school with a lot of these Swansea City supporters. And um, whenever I go down to watch, uh, whenever I go down to visit my parents, I'm always there. I always go and watch the lads play. My mate's got a couple of boxes in the stadium, the Liberty Stadium. I'll always go in and, and have a nice afternoon with the, with the lads and watch the Swans play. Um, so I think the love for the club never leaves you. It's, it's my hometown club. It's, it's the one team that I support. I love Liverpool because Rushy was my hero growing up and Rushy was Welsh goal scorer and he played for Liverpool. So I followed Liverpool, Toshak, um, Keegan, Dalglish, Rush, these great players. Um, the great success that they had as well. Liverpool. Um, so I love Liverpool, but my, my real love is is Swansea because it's my hometown. You know, I think Nicky but supports uh, Rochdale or Postgold. Oh, yeah. Uh, Oldham. He's an Oldham, Oldham supporter. Yeah. Because these guys, you know, they live in that, just outside Manchester in these communities and whatever. Berry, Hull, uh, sorry, um, Berry, Rochdale, all these places, Oldham. And, and that's, that's who they support. Although they had great success for United, their clubs are these little smaller clubs where they went as a kid with their parents and watched these probably unknown players that you, you hear of now, but they know they are. I could name the Swansea team in the 80s under John Toshak, you know. Um, so it never leaves you. So Swansea was always always my team still. So that will never leave me. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Interesting. So moving on to centre, the centre forward. Here we I think this is probably going to be the worst kept secret ever because I think I'm guessing you've been Larson. a few times. Larson. It has to be Larson. It has <laughs> to be Henrik. And again, I apologise to Chris Sutton and Craig Bellamy and Mark Hughes and Ian Wright. And, but Henrik, I have, to, I have to put him along, you know, in terms of these other greats. He is a great. He's a Celtic great. And he's a magnificent player. Great man. Um, <clears throat> didn't know an awful lot about him before I arrived at the club. But, um, you know, Kenny Daglish was the king, but they called Larson the king of kings, you know, because um, he just, the amount of times that he would just um, score the winning goal and he produced that little bit of magic and so consistent. I think he got 242 goals in 315 games. And, and the one thing people will have the audacity to criticise him about was that he did it in the Scottish leagues. But don't forget, when Henrik left Celtic, he went and played for Manchester United and he won a Champions League winner's medal at Barcelona. Yes. Um, played in three or four tournaments, European Championships for Sweden, played in World Cups for Sweden, record European goal scorer for Celtic in European competition. So his achievements are, are phenomenal. And um, again, very humble, but a, a great player. I think when you... When you mention the word great, it's probably a word that's used a little bit more frequent than just in conversation. Oh, he's a great player, he's a great player. But great players, they do exceptional things. And uh, Henrik was, was a great player. Um, and as I said, it was myself, Chris Sutton and Henrik. And then you had Lambert and Petrov and Lennon, Agat, Thompson. At the back, we had Valharan, who was Belgian. We had um, Johan Mialbi, Swedish, um, Lubo Moravchik, who was a fantastic player. Um, so, as I said, again, Henrik, is, there's no words, really, what, what he achieved at Celtic. And, and he was a great strike partner of mine as well. We scored an awful lot of goals together. So he takes that number nine through the middle. And again, I've left quite a few players out. But I think that's a that's a really really good team, and I've I've tried oh. to be humble. I've tried to be humble. I've tried to be professional. I, I said to you, Mark, didn't I yesterday? I could pick three teams. Yeah, <laughs> I could honestly pick three teams. And I said this about three months ago on the BBC in Scotland, and I probably said a different team. <laughs> <laughs> so you know. It's like last night I sat in the in the lounge in there and I was just watching the I think I was watching the golf and I started putting the team together and everything. And even about ten minutes before I came on air, I changed two positions <laughs> and two different names because well, I could easily put other players in, you know. 
Well, Andrew was just saying that before we go on. He is saying, I mean, we're going. We don't want to like give too much away of too many guests we've got coming on. But yourself was going to be like literally. There's so so many to yeah. choose from because of the career you've had, and it was just like, what? I mean, what's it? How's he going to choose? Who's? How can he leave people out? Like you just said there, you've done this two or three times, and the team's probably changed about two or three different times. Thing is as well, Mark. Thing is as well, Mark. You know, I could even go back to Luton players. Mm. You know, and, and little David Priest, little genius, <sighs> wasn't he? Yeah. yeah. You know, and probably not a lot of people outside of Luton will disrespect. Um, lots would, but lots wouldn't either, because he was just a fantastic player for Luton. Um, and he, God rest his soul, you know, yeah. he, he lost his, he lost his, um, lost his life, his, his battle. Um, several years ago, we were both at the funeral. It was very sad because he was mm-hmm. great to me coming through our Luton <sighs> David Priest. There's little players like Priestley I could have put in. Yeah. Mick Harford I could give a mention to. Yeah. You know, um, there was lots of players uh, back then, and there's, there's been other players, one or two players at Coventry. You know, like um, Roland Nielsen, the Swedish right back, had over a hundred caps for Sweden. What a player Nielsen was for Sweden, international, incredible. So there's there's there's, there's clubs that I've represented. Um, you know that I, I could have like a couple of West Brom players even or whatever or one or two at, at Norwich. Darren Huckabee was a really good centre forward and a right. great career. So it's, it's loads of other teams that no, I played no, with. Yeah. That um, and I've only gone for the big players from the big clubs because they are the outstanding players. They right. deserve to be in there because they are at them outstanding, not yeah. sort of global mega clubs. And that's as big a you know team as you 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 get from me. But I could have yeah. mentioned the other guys: Luton, Norwich, West yeah. Brom. Where there were several really good players: Nigel Quasi at West Brom. <sighs> what a brilliant yeah. competitor Nigel Quasi was. In the middle, Jonathan Green in great skills on the right hand side. Yeah. Zoltan Gira. Zoltan was incredible. Yeah. Um, the Hungarian winger. Gira was unbelievable. One of the greatest players ever to come out and play for Hungary. Uh, Hungary, <laughs> sorry, Hungary. Um, so there you are, Hungary. <laughs> I like to start again. Just going back to your Celtic days, I mean, obviously you played in the London derby. I mean, I, was, I mean, the, the, the Celtic reign. I mean, that's the big thing which everyone talks about that game. I mean, and you had many an impact in many of those games, scoring some big, big goals. I mean, what was it like? I mean, one to be in that atmosphere of where you know the rivalry is so so big, and the game itself is a massive game because I mean, I don't know too much about it. I mean, I think I know yeah. enough that. That's the fixtures they look for the sports. That is the fixture. Don't matter oh, anything else. That's it. And they are the games. They are the games you want to win for the supporters. You played in many a Luton Watford. Mm-hmm. Now a derby is only a derby in relation to where you come from or who you support. Like Luton Watford is 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 is, is no less a derby than Celtic Rangers to Luton fans and to Watford fans because that's what it means to beat your rivals. Correct. The fact that Celtic and Rangers are global, worldwide supported clubs. Um, Glasgow hotbed of football Celtic Rangers um, you know is an incredible fierce derby I, I played in over 20 derbies I uh, was successful I scored the winning goal in um, in three out of the four derbies I think it was um, and they are the games you generally endear yourself to the crowd if you can do well in them games you know you, you'll get the keys to one half of the city you know, only one half by the way but, um, <laughs> You know, I managed to get some goals and um, some great wins at Ibrox as well, Rangers Stadium. And, um, you know, a lot, a lot of people think it's the biggest derby in the world. You know, because you asked Graham Souness, who's managed at Galatasaray and who's won three European Cups for Liverpool, and he managed Rangers. <clears throat> he helped Rangers win nine in a row. You asked Gascoigne, who's played Roma Lazio, many a Tottenham, Arsenal. Yeah. Gaza would probably tell you no game like this one. He played in many games for Rangers against other great players. We'd have to ask Henrik Larsson what his view is. But um, just because of what it stands for, Celtic Rangers, two sets of yeah. fans who um, have a particular disliking for each other, uh, you know, massive police presence at, at the grounds and everything else. And 
the rivalry, you know, centuries, um, watched by three or four hundred countries all over the world, you know, the, the old firm game, the derby. <clears throat> so, but there's massive, some huge derby games, aren't there? You look at Man United, Liverpool's a huge one, Liverpool, Everton. You know, I was lucky to play Arsenal Spurs in quite a few of them games. West Ham Spurs is a big yeah. game as well. You know, um, I was lucky I played for Wales against England at Old Trafford in the European Championships. Unfortunately, we lost 2-0 at uh, <coughs> Old Trafford. That's a big one as well, two big country rivals. Um, no, I've played in many a big derby, Marv. I, the only one I didn't play was Luton Watford, strangely enough. You played in a few of them. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. <laughs> No, Constable Bedford. Ah. Constable Bedford. Played in that one. <laughs> oh, brilliant. So, brilliant. so we've got the team now, John. So who, yeah. which manager, which manager is going to be the one to lead this team? Well, that's probably my toughest call <clears throat> um, because I played under 16, 17 managers. Wow. And, and, and five or six of their managers paid record money for me paid record money for me, went to the chairman, went to the owners and said, I want this player. This is what he's going to cost. It's going to be, we're going to have to break the bank, break our transfer record fee to sign this player. And they did that. You know, I broke the record. I went to Celtic for 6 million. I went to uh, Wimbledon, 7.5 million. I went to West Ham for 3.2 million record. Harry never, West Ham never spent that money on a player. And Arsenal, expensive teenager, 2.5 million. So it's a difficult one because I've got great respect for the managers that backed me, played me, you know, through thick and thin when I weren't having a great time, kept me in the team, kept me say, motivated. Keep, keep a player motivated is, is, is unthinkable because you've got to motivate yourself. But sometimes you're having a bit of a bad day or you haven't trained well and managers would come down on you hard. The manager that would just give you that little bit of a respite and say, hey, come on, you you were crap today. You were poor today. I want a bit more tomorrow. Nothing wrong with that. And then the next day I'm flying because I took that confidence from that. He could have hung me under a bus. He could have embarrassed me. He didn't. There's little things like that for me that make the difference, you know. Um, so the ones that I great respect for, I love Mark Hughes. I loved him as a player and I loved him as my manager for the national team for five years. He played me. Um, Set the forward, played every game under him. And uh, he was brilliant, Sparky, with me personally. The other ones were Gordon Strachan, who, who got me really fit one year at Celtic. That's sorry, at Coventry. Then told me to go to Celtic and then joined Celtic. And I won my last title <clears throat> under him. His first year at Celtic, he won the title. It was my last year. Um, Gordon Strachan... Martin O'Neill was incredible. He was just, um, you know, Martin was a genius. You get the best out of you. Just little things he'd say to you. Um, not, not overly um, in terms of what he would say. He wouldn't say an awful lot, but what he did say, he said it with common sense. And he'd say to me, John, I want you to do two things today. And I'm looking at him, I'm thinking, what? he says, when the ball comes into you, he says, don't have 30 things in your mind. Have one thing on your mind. It's genius. Put your foot on the ball, right? Just put your foot on the ball. Hold it up for three or four seconds. Allow us to come up the pitch as a team. Give us a breather. Hold on to the ball. And if you can, just for me today, pass it to a green and white shirt. <laughs> and that was the only instructions I had. If you can, just give it to a green and white shirt. It was genius. Is that all I've got, is that all I've got to do? Do you know what I mean? But um, now I knew I had to get across people and I knew I had to win headers and I knew I had to hold the ball up and do things and work the defenders. <clears throat> but he'd simplify it. He'd very much simply say to Henry Glass and Henry, do what you want. I can't, I can't teach you how to score a goal. Just go and score goals for me, sir. Do you know what I mean? Just that, Chris, how can I teach you to hold the ball up when you've got that big sort of barrel chest where when the ball's in the air, goalkeeper's kick out, Marv, and the ball's there and the referee's looking at the ball and Chris Sutton just goes bang and he goes boop and it's there. Did it every week. 
and the referee's looking at the ball. Chris is nudging the defender into his chest. He was a genius at it, best I've ever seen. Um, so Martin would say, Chris, I can't teach you how to do that. I haven't got your strength. I haven't got your capabilities. Go and do what you did last week. And it just very simplified it. Uh, Addy Redknapp was brilliant. Um, he makes you play better as well. Great in the dressing room. Can take, can take an average player and get him going, praise him and make him special. You know, with the respect that player would have for Harry. Um, but the one I'm going to say is, is Martin O'Neill because um, he took a chance on me. I failed a few medicals before I arrived at Celtic because of my knee. And he took a chance on me when I came back and I scored 110 goals for Celtic um, under Martin O'Neill. And he got me in the team and I stayed in the team. And um, so for that reason, uh, Martin O'Neill would, would be in charge. And Martin could handle all these big players. The Burke camps, you know, the, the egos, if you like. Um, none of these players, they all had egos, but they had it in a certain way that it wasn't arrogant. They knew they were good. They knew they were the best. They knew they would win because if he did his job, I did my job and it, it functions really well. And that's what you get with top players. That's why they're so successful because, yes, they've all got egos, but the egos don't come out. You know, it's, it's driven, it's right. within them. Uh, and it's a good thing because they, they know they're the best. You've got to go onto the pitch thinking you're the best. Yeah, that, that's, that's what brings yeah, the best yeah. out of you, you know. And Martin, Martin would be able to handle that. He'd handle all them big players and all the demands and everything else. So um, it would be Martin O'Neill that would manage the team. Well, he, he learned from the best, Martin O'Neill, of course, by of course. Um, of course, working underneath or, or playing underneath um, arguably one of the Brian greatest Clough. managers ever with Brian Clough, yeah. So <laughs> yeah. learn from him. Yeah, well, I, I, everything was about Brian Clough, really. And um, I remember hearing so many stories about Brian Clough because Martin's assistant was John Robertson. John Robertson made the goal in 79 and scored the winning goal in 80, two European Cups, made the goal for Trevor Francis. And then the, the, the year after, Nottingham Forest won two European Cups. Yeah. And that's all Martin and Rob will talk about is Brian Clough and, and the good days and the stories and everything. So... On the bus traveling up to Aberdeen or Inverness, they're there making us laugh, and it was brilliant. It was a really good group. Uh, we all loved the, the manager and, and his staff. And I remember Martin said to me once, he said, John, he said, when I go for a job, he said, I don't have a CV. And I went, well, What do you mean? He said, Well, I just tell the owners or whoever I'm speaking to, chief execs or whoever's appointed to appoint the next manager I just said um, I just say that 25 years Brian Clough man and boy I worked under Brian Clough and I believe he's the greatest and I do everything based on Brian Clough <laughs> he gets the job <laughs> so, you know, not a bad CV to have 25 years no, under Brian not at all. you know ma not man not and boy ma you know exactly. boy and man if you like. so it's, it's not a bad um it's not a bad person to, to, to learn off, is it? No, no not at all. And I, and, um, I mean, just before we go into what about the the stuff, what you're doing now, so everyone knows, I mean, our connection is Luton. And one of my I mean, final questions is, like, um, what is your most memorable Luton game and why? Well, it has to be one of my first, Marv, um, the night that we knocked Newcastle yeah. out of the FA Cup. The might of Newcastle, Kevin Keegan's Newcastle, Beardsley, Cole, um, Venison, Robin, Robin Robin Lee, yeah. Yeah. Lee. Lee, yeah, um, who's the boy who played for Everton in midfield, great player, Bracewell, Bracewell, Howie at the back, was it, was it, how, was it Howie, Howie, Venison, yes. Cooper in goal, and they were flying. I think they were top of the first division at the time. And I'll never, never forget big killer, Brian Kilcline <laughs> and Mick Harford were in the Sky Studio with Richard Keyes that night. Remember the old boxes that leaving yeah. across, across the way? And Brian Kilcline commented, this should be a stroll. We won't get near Kevin Keegan. We, we play so much great football. Cole and Beardsley at front. Andy yeah. Cole. 
you know, ridiculous. What a striker Coley was. And he was flying for Newcastle. Yeah. Beardsley sliding him in. Unbelievable partnership. Solid. I think Lee Clark played. Did Clarkie play? Yeah, Lee Clark played, yeah. I mean, that's... Yeah. Um, and we turned them over. 2-0 and it was rammed. Kettleworth Road, 8,500 people, 9,000. It was live on Sky Sports. Yeah. My big moment. Um, Kerry got injured. Um, I think... And I, I came into the team because I think then Kerry played the next game. He scored a hat-trick. Or he set up Oxy's hat-trick against West Ham, didn't he? But that was my big moment. It was live on Sky. I was 18 years of age. And then all of a sudden, I'd scored this goal. Um, I should, Peaky put me through. And Mike Hooper came out. And I just got a touch around him. I slid it into an empty net. And I've still got the photo out there of Preci and Jamie Campbell sort of surrounding me. I've got a nice pair of curtains at the time. Uh, they were a bit thin, mind you, but uh, I remember celebrating. We beat Newcastle 2-0, um, having been robbed at St James's Park. Because I remember Thorpe, he scored a 30-yarder, yeah. and then easily fell in the box. That's right. Picked himself up and scored the penalty. We should have won that game 1-0. Beasley got the equaliser, and that's when we took them back to Kellerworth Road. They were probably thinking, well, just turn up. Kevin Keegan, confident, great team, didn't have to do a lot. We were right up for it that night and we had a brilliant 2-0 victory. So the fact it was on television, it was really my first my first sort of time that I'd been on telly. The fact that we knocked out the might of Newcastle live on TV, um, it gave us all a little bit of profile, didn't it? You know, yeah. David Pluth would take us up to Stephen Purdue's, Henlo Grange, Henlo every Grange, time yeah. we got to the semi-final that year. Unfortunately, we lost to Chelsea. Um, in the semi-final, a game that David Pleat chose to play Kerry ahead of me because of his um, relationship with Chelsea. And I, was Again, scenes, man. I was bursting at the scenes to go. I know, I can imagine. I mean, it could have been, like, again, I remember, I mean, I was, again, injured. Didn't I mean, wasn't involved, but that, I feel, no disrespect to Kerry, because he's, he's a legend. I mean, they would have been a little bit more happier with... Uh, more like aging Kerry Dixon than a young John Hartson running well, around. That, that, yeah, I remember the, let the Chelsea fans, you know, sang one Kerry Dixon all throughout the game. Kerry, 200 goals for Chelsea, one of the Lampard's the record goal scorer, and Kerry's goal for 200 goals. He is an absolute legend there. What a player Kerry was for them in the 80s, you know, banging in goals uh, every week. And again, Kerry's a big friend of ours. Um, but I remember that day, it was Tony Cascarino for Chelsea yeah. that won it for Chelsea that day. It was um, Gavin Peacock scored Peacock, two yeah. goals. They won 2-0. Chelsea beat Luton in 1994. And um, Gavin Peacock, he beat David Green and Trevor Peak. Beat them to both headers to make goals. Because Cask was Cask was an aggressive head of the ball as well. You know, yeah. Cask was flying and Good player, Cass, when he played for Millwall and eventually went to, um, he's a legend in Marseille, you know, Tony Casco, yeah. you know. That's another story anyway. Um, but we got beat. But that was probably one of my memorable games. It's the only time in my career I ever played at Wembley. Unfortunately wow. for me, I sat on the bench. But another another interesting point there, because David Priest was alive. And we were on the way to the game. It was a late kickoff. It was a quarter past five kickoff. And the Grand National was on at 20 past three, right? And I like the bet back then, right? And the winner of the Grand National in 1994 was, we had a great player playing for us. I've mentioned him, Mini, the yeah. priest, called him Mini. The winner of the Grand National was a horse called Mini Oma, won the Grand National, and we were all on it. We were all on Mini Oma because Mini was on our bus. He was a player. Yeah. And that's the horse that won the 1994 Grand National, Mini Oma. So that was another interesting thing that happened to us. We'd have rather won the semi final, man, yeah. than the Grand National. But it was one of those things. And we really all backed it because Mini was on our bus. God rest his soul. Right. He's not with us anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> So, John, listen, I want to, like, on behalf of myself and Andrew, listen, thank you for, like, coming on and doing this. Um, 
like I said, just before we go away, we spoke earlier on about obviously um, your cancer and the stuff you do with charity. Can you just like, I mean, we know you do a little bit with Sky and stuff. Can you just like give some of the listeners a little bit about what you're doing now? Well, 10 years ago, um, 11 years ago now, sorry, 2009, I was diagnosed with testicular cancer. That spread to my lungs and onto my brain and I, I was in desperate trouble. I'd left it too long. I hadn't gone and get, got checked. If I had, then maybe I wouldn't have allowed it to have spread. I was a bit ignorant of my health. And um, while I was getting on with my life, the cancer was unbeknown to my knowledge. It was spreading from my testicle while I had a tumour and it spread to my lungs and onto my brain. So when I actually went and got diagnosed, I was in desperate trouble. I had to go straight into hospital. Um, I had to have two emergency brain operations, which is one in there and there's one at the back there. Um, I had a tracheotomy. I had all sorts of different things. I had two operations on my lungs. Um, and through the grace of God, I came through that treatment. Uh, I don't know why I did because I was in so much trouble. Um, I needed so much help and attention to my body. And the NHS, they pulled out all the stops to help me and to give me the right treatment. And I got the luck that you need um, to, to beat this horrible, horrible um, illness. I was gonna say, it's not a disease. You know, it's not a cold, it's not a flu, it's, it's cancer. And cancer takes an awful lot of good people away from us. Um, and it's a serious, it's a serious word, cancer. When you say cancer, people go, Oof, you know, um, and I had cancer that spread to my brain. So at one stage, I was very, very lucky. Uh, my family were with me every step of the way. Um, I got the right treatment and everything went smoothly for me and I managed to come through that. So when I came through the cancer, my initial thoughts were, well, how do you thank the the surgeons and the nurses that gave me all that great care for six weeks um, through my ups, through my downs, looking after my family. My father would sleep every night by the side of my bed. My wife was pregnant. It was, it was, it was an awful period. Um, and the doctors and the nurses, they just, they went over and above in terms of the support and the care that they not only showed me, but showed everybody that came to visit me. And lots of people visited and called and the mail was incredible. The, you know, the telegrams, the flowers, the cards, the hospital, I've never seen anything like it. Rangers supporters, I played for Celtic, Cardiff City supporters, Tottenham supporters, fans from other clubs that I maybe upset down the years. But when it's someone's life and things like that, you know, football is secondary then, football don't matter, you know. And I was fighting for my life. I was in a fight, basically. So I managed to come through that. Um, and then, as I said, you know, the one thing I wanted to do was, was thank everybody concerned with, with my health, who'd helped me, who'd play just any little part in getting me back to full health. Um, I, I, I spoke to a few people, my family in particular, and they said, well, why don't you set up a, a foundation? raise money, um, give, give it all back to the hospitals. Um, and I managed to, we've raised over a million pounds, the John Hartson Foundation. And uh, we've helped many hospices and children's hospitals and things like that. And I, I couldn't have done it on my own now. I've got a wonderful team of people that um, put the events on, sell the tickets, and then we have to rely on people come in and bidding for auctions and raffle tickets and everything else. Um, and it's superbly run. It's run by accountants and charity, the commission. Everything is run absolutely immaculately, which it has to be. Um, right. And we do a wonderful job with things. You know, we sell out every event that we put on. And um, we've, we've been doing it now for nearly 10 years. And uh, we've raised an awful lot of money. And it's something that, you know, something that, I'm more proud of that than scoring any goal in any stadium, you know, with any team, because it's something that is close to my heart. And I feel as if I've <clears throat> given something back in a positive right. way, you know, raising awareness and everything else. 
And as I said, we, we could never have done what I've achieved without, without the kindness and the goodness of the, of the public, in particular everywhere, but in particular here in Scotland, in Glasgow, where my charity office is based. And um, it's, it's been a wonderful journey. I don't know how long we're going to continue with it because we've, you know, we've, we've got to our, our level of what we wanted to, to, to achieve, the million barrier. Um, but it's been, it's been a ride. It's been excellent. And mm-hmm. every time I do an event, I end up crying because somebody is there that has lost a parent or has lost somebody close to them. I end up in the bar with them, having a few drinks at the end of the night. It gets me going. It gets them going. Um, but we're wonderfully, wonderful, uh, really wonderful charity and extremely um, happy with where it's gone and what we've been able to achieve, you know. Have you got, have you got a website, John, where any of the listeners can? Yeah, it's, it's www.thejohnhartsonfoundation.com. If you go on there, you can see what we've raised, where our, our next event is. We're a bit slow in the next event because our golf day has been put back from April to October. Now it was meant to be November, but it's been put back to next April in 2021. We're okay for the golf, as they've said, but we can't do the auctions and everything in the night. And of course, that's where you make the funds, you know, in the evening time. So uh, we've got one or two proposed sort of places and events that we talk into other um, places and, and events at the minute and Ben Nevis was a big one for us as well, the big climb, the biggest mountain in Britain, <coughs> in Fort William. So uh, we got uh, events sort of proposed but we're all waiting on this COVID-19 and this pandemic before we can really get going with selling tickets and, and getting it out there, you know. Excellent, fantastic. Awesome, well um, thank you so much for um, that's that um, for being so open with that, it's, it's really great to hear right. somebody, no somebody say that. Me and Marv, uh, we, we're great friends and it's great that we, I've been able to do this and catch up with Marv and, you know, we both um, never forgot, you know, the respect and Marv was brilliant to me, I'm not just saying it, when I was a kid, um, he very much looked after me, 10, 11, 12 years of age, your parents sent you 500 miles up the motorway and uh, they just hope that you get in with the right people and people will look after you. And um, he used to bring me a bottle of Lucas Aid up when the manager, the, we, the, the Lucas Aid bottle, there'd be one, there'd be one pot left, little box, little hole for the Lucas Aid, and it'd be gone and the manager would get on and Marv had brought it up to me. So I'd be drinking it and the manager would go without it. But Marv was always like, that's for you, John. He'd always look <laughs> after me the place you, I don't know how you remember that. <laughs> Man, that's just- Marv. I remember Chelsea when you were in the youth team, I used to go on the bus and um, I remember everything. I remember the, the five aside through, you know, we used to play the five sides at Wembley Arena. I yeah. met Robbie James one night. Robbie James, my dad said to me, go and see Robbie James. He was playing for QPR. And Robbie's unfortunately not with us anymore. Robbie passed away a while back and I went to see Robbie James and he said, I know your dad because he was playing for Swansea. And I was only 11 years of age. Oh, Rob wow. Johnson all the guys from Luton. So that's why Luton for me is so special because I didn't just play there. I grew up there, you know, yeah. and I stayed in different homes with different digs and, and the people that I met. And Luton's a special club. A lot of clubs say we always get the, the boys back and we give them a good... And, and lots of clubs do. Celtic is one for that. You know, they welcome all their old players back. But Luton, I think anybody, Ricky Hill, Brian Steen, Mick Fozzie... We all we all love going back, and we've all got great memories of playing for Luton. Awesome. Well, thank you so so much for your time. Um, it's been great to hear um, John Hartson's best eleven. Um, and if anybody wants to um, comment or anything like that on us, we're, our Twitter handle, of course, is um, at My Best Eleven Pod. Um, and I'm sure that John will be more than happy to um, chuck a few comments on there and um, have a bit of banter with any fans who have got any questions or or even have got a few queries with some of his teams and some of his picks. Um, so please feel free to jump on there. Um, and thank you very much for your time, um, John. What we do like to finish off with, though, is give you an opportunity to say um, a message to fans of any clubs. Well, I think the fans, uh, with myself, I, I don't really um, 
with myself. It was always, I think, one of the reasons I, I got on with most clubs and fans because I think they saw something a little bit in me of them. I'm, I'm from a council estate in Swansea. I probably overachieved in my career. Um, I, had, I had lots of endeavour and I had lots of dreams and I was very positive. Um, I wanted to get to where I got. And I think the supporters looked at that and thought, well, there's an honest, there's an honest person in there um, from a council estate, like, like most people. Um, and I always tried my best. I always give my hardest. And sometimes I will never go down as an Ian Rush or a Kenny Dalglish or a Henrik Larsson because they were superstars and they were wonderful, wonderful, talented, brilliant individuals. But what I'll go down as a decent player, a decent man, uh, a father, a decent husband, and uh, and what else do you want to be remembered as? Just just Big John, really. John John likes a pint, likes a good crack, likes good company, and I'm all right. You know, I'm all right. Oh, definitely, definitely. Thank you so much for your time. Um, thank you, My John. Pleasure. Awesome.